This is Utkar Shahuja from uh, Taikon Live. Welcome. Today I am sitting here with Vinod Dham. Vinod, as uh, most of us know, is, uh, has been acclaimed worldwide as the father of the Pentium processor. And he is currently the co-founder of New Path Ventures. And uh, Vinod, if you can tell to our viewers a little bit about your life up till now, your story, where you grew up, how you eventually made your way to the U.S., a little bit about your educational background and how you've essentially gotten to where you are today. Oh, that's a pretty long uh, story to tell, <laughs> but I'll try to be as brief as I can. Take your time. Uh, I did uh, grow up in India and uh, did my bachelor's degree there from Delhi College of Engineering in Delhi University, which itself is a story. <laughs> I never was interested in engineering, so I'm an accidental engineer, to I be see. honest with you. <laughs> my interest was physics. Okay. And uh, it was on the urging of my uh, elder brothers who felt that uh, physics was not going to lead to a very successful uh, career, that uh, I was forced into at last minute switching my uh, academics from physics to engineering. Okay. And uh, rest is history. Uh, I came here uh, in 1975, and uh, what led me to come here was, you know, I was uh, again accidentally hired by a company in India, which turned out to be the only semiconductor company that was existing in India in 1971 when I graduated. Okay. And that was my first encounter with semiconductors. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with it mm -hmm. because not only uh, it needed a lot of application of physics, but chemistry mm -hmm. and mathematics and all the other sciences that I had studied uh, as a nerd in college. So I really <laughs> got turned on by this uh, field. Right. And that brought me to take a master's degree in solid state physics mm -hmm. uh, here in the U.S. And where, where in the U.S. did you... Uh so, actually pursue your degree. Yeah, I think that's another interesting degree. I mean, I uh, back then my dad was retired. Uh, I'm talking about in the 70s. U.S. didn't have a very good image of, uh, uh, India didn't have a very good image about U.S. Mm -hmm. And Berkeley had major riots and people were right. getting killed. Right. So I got into Berkeley where my dad said, you know, uh, it's not a safe place to go to. I also got into the University of Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. We had to go to Connaught Place in Delhi to get a map of USA detail enough to know where Cincinnati was. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the school had a complete setup of semiconductor facility where you could uh, grow the crystals, slice the wafers, build the mask, and fabricate chips, assemble them, and test them, which was uh, unheard of it's in phenomenal. India, where you couldn't even do that in a factory. Right. They were able to do that in a school. I uh, came in to do PhD. Mm -hmm. And along the way, I got corrupted, like most people do. This country has just too many distractions. <laughs> uh, you guys have many more than uh, we had. <laughs> but my distraction was to buy stereo amplifiers and cars and things like that. And I knew that if I was going to do PhD, it's going to be many more years. Mm -hmm. I shifted my gears and requested my uh, advisor and dean, who happened to be dean of Cincinnati's uh, uh, electrical engineering department, mm -hmm. that I would like to only finish my master's program and then... Uh, not finish my PhD, which disappointed him right. highly, but as a trade-off to let me do that, he said, well, if you go out and interview with NCR, I would uh, allow you to just finish your master's and go and, and, and go to the workplace and give you the recommendation that you need. Okay. And I interviewed at NCR and fortunately got a job on the same day mm -hmm. that I interviewed. Joined there with a, a guy from Bell Labs who mm -hmm. had uh, been doing some research in what's called non-volatile memories. Mm -hmm. That basically stands for flash. As you know, it's right. a device that goes into <laughs> cameras uh, for storing photos. Right. And so we did some of the early work on that uh, technology. I was involved with him. I published uh, quite a few patents and uh, papers on it. It was during one of those papers that I was presenting to an IEEE workshop here in Monterey, California, that an Intel guy who was in the audience approached me and stole me out of NCR and brought me to Intel. And that was year 1979. I think it's very interesting that uh, one of the things that a lot of our viewers tend to forget is that uh, you were also one of the early pioneers in flash, Yes. Uh, flash technology as well. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, my initial uh, entry into Intel was to continue doing the work I was doing at NCR mm -hmm. to create this non-volatile memory, uh, which is what we call flash in, in the commercial terms today. And so from 1979 till uh, 1985 or 86, I actually did a lot of the basic development about this structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, myself and two other uh, guys are co-inventors of the Intel flash technology uh, I see. That's being used widely all over the world. No, that's great. Then can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration for the actual uh, microprocessor idea? 
So I, I would not claim that I was inspired to build the microprocessor. The microprocessor had existed before I really got into mm -hmm. uh, the f first program I worked on was 386 microprocessor. Mm -hmm. And you can see some of those uh, pro uh, chips right, right here right. in the background. And uh, so I as I transitioned from R&D mode, technology mode into design and business mode, uh, mm -hmm. 386 was the first uh, product that I worked on. And then uh, subsequently worked on 486, which was really a... Uh, improvement upon 386, which was multiple chips, and we integrated all of them into a right. single chip. Uh, but the real uh, breakthrough came through with Pentium, Pentium right. because uh, at the time of Pentium, the inspiration really was more of a fear of failure than <laughs> anything else, to be very honest with you, because mm -hmm. by then the industry had caught on to that microprocessor being a very, very important element of the uh, overall business. Sure. And there were a lot of competition from Sun Microsystem to MIPS mm -hmm. Technologies to IBM to uh, HP. And there were various companies who were spending uh, hundreds of millions of dollars doing R&D right. and developing products that could really encroach upon uh, Intel's uh, leadership in that area. And I think it was a fear of not uh, uh, you know, letting that happen is what drove the success of Pentium. The unforeseen challenge, I think, that came about in Pentium is a famous Pentium bug. Mm -hmm. that uh, every microprocessor had a bug, 486 had one, 386 had Pentium, and subsequent Pentiums had it. Right. But what was unique about this bug was, at the time uh, when this bug came, Pentium, for the first time in the history of uh, industry, anywhere in the world, had become a household name. Mm -hmm. Intel had become a household name with the right. Intel Insight campaign. So there was a very different expectation of the, uh, the, 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 the consumers from Intel, even though Intel didn't sell a, directly a chip to a consumer, they only bought a uh, computer, mm -hmm. they still knew that inside the computer there was a chip, and if the chip had a flaw, yeah. they wanted that company to show up to the bar <laughs> and really claim that, yes, we will do something about it. And I think we at Intel were somewhat delinquent in addressing that mm -hmm. concern, and so we got a lot of flack for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you are in Silicon Valley and you have uh, not done a startup, then something is wrong with you. Right. That's the basic premise of rest of my life's history. And mm -hmm. so I was always in the back of my mind wondering about, you know, uh, when should I go do the startup? And what happened uh, around Pentium was not only Pentium became very successful, I was also vice president at Intel, mm -hmm. which to me almost becomes a uh, kind of in a academic environment like a tenure. You know, right. once you become a vice president, you are just a company man, you're a corporation guy, you're there for the rest of your life, you end up whatever you end up, and you retire there. Mm -hmm. And that whole thought was just uh, very difficult for me to grasp. Mm -hmm. And so I really felt this was my opportunity to either leave Intel at that stage and go try my hand at doing a startup mm -hmm. or never again would I get that opportunity. So I really right. took the the leap of faith and you know this is where my wife really comes in. She was the one who was behind no, me in uh, convincing me that it was okay for me to go ahead and take that risk. I say to people often that the best thing that ever happened to me in my life was to join Intel and the next best thing that ever happened to my life was to leave Intel mm -hmm. because I would have never discovered this whole uh, underground life, the right. dark side, if you will, uh, <laughs> of this uh, startup world and yeah. fundraising and venturing into becoming a venture capital right. had I not left Intel. And, uh, and so currently, you've started a, a venture firm, uh, New Path Ventures? Two venture firms, Two, New, sorry, Path New Path and right. NEA Indo-US Ventures, right. which is my second fund. Right, and so if you can tell us a little bit about, uh, about both of these. Yeah, so having uh, done NextGen, which was my first foray into uh, doing a startup, uh, I was second in command, right. and I really helped engineer some of the exit for the company by uh, having the chips become Pentium bus compatible, which was a big, big breakthrough mm -hmm. for the proprietary chip that NextGen was creating so that they could really get into mainstream PC market. Then, since I had not really uh, done a startup from A to Z, I felt that I need to really go learn what it takes to go do it from A to Z. So I captured a Silicon Spice at very, very early stage when they had about a dozen or so people mm -hmm. and then took it to exit and did all the fundraisings and management and hiring and staffing and redirecting the company. All the steps that a entrepreneur has to typically go through to really make a, a successful right. startup. Now I had the credibility to be sitting and coaching somebody who could look at me and saying, okay, this guy has walked in these shoes. So when he gives me advice, I can really take that advice right. at the face value. Uh, is when I think thought of going into venture capital and started my first fund, New Path Ventures, mm -hmm. which was more of an incubation of few companies with monies that came mostly from VCs to create that fund mm -hmm. initially to a real venture capital fund, which is the NEA Indo-US Ventures. Mm -hmm. It's really a partnership with NEA 
who are affiliates with us, who lend their brand and a lot of coaching and guidance and also help tremendously in the fundraising part of uh, the NEA Indo US Ventures. But I have two partners in Bangalore, India. It's an India focused fund mm -hmm. that invests in India with the Indian entrepreneurs for the Indian market by and large. Although me being here, we also do some cross border investments where the markets are here, but the uh, development still takes place in India. Okay. We are glad that we are pioneering that. We are on the leading edge of it and will establish our brand and hopefully uh, become a well-known venture capital company in India. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this has been Vinod Dham coming to you from Tycon Live.